So hello everybody, it's a big honor to me to be here with Michael Yako, which is one of the uh, most important brief therapists and hypnotherapist which conducted uh, studies and intervention about hypnosis. It's a pleasure to me to having uh, you here, Michael. Thank you for accepting to do this interview. My pleasure, thank you. And so, if you're ready, we can start. Okay. So, uh, I just want to start having a very little um, idea about brief therapy, the state of art in brief therapy and depression. What we know today about this problem and about the way of brief therapy to do useful in treating depression. Well, depression is a global shorthand for a, a pretty wide variety of symptoms and patterns that all contribute to the experience. And so regardless of whether someone's therapy is short term or longer term, depending how severe the depression is, how complicated the depression is, regardless, Every depression expert would agree that treatment needs to be as active as possible. And this is, of course, the overlap with brief therapy approaches. One of the things to appreciate about brief therapy is that it defines the relationship as an active one, that the therapist is not hesitating to direct the course of therapy to achieve particular outcomes. In the context of treating depression, we're often having to help people develop particular skills that will help them overcome depression. So those skills might be coping skills, they might be problem solving skills, they could be social skills, they could be all of those things and more. And so the idea, of course, isn't that you're just limiting yourself to to a specific number of sessions, but it's more an attitude of every session moving the person closer to getting better, every session having a purpose and a direction to it, and this is what brief therapy is about, therapy with direction. This is very, very interesting because um, you talk. You talk a lot about to be, uh, if I understand, to be uh, direct with, with the client to um, say to the client to do a specific task, and uh, uh, this uh, mm, uh, this helped me to remember a thing that uh, you told me before uh, many years ago when we do a first interview for uh, another website I have and. Uh, you talk about the language of change. Um, I remember you talk about uh, Paul Václavík, the language of change, his book, and you say that that's probably a book that every therapist should read. So um, I think about the communication, the language. Uh, how is the language with a depression, with, with a depressed? patient, uh, in, in which way a therapist must communicate with a depressed patient? Well, one of the things about depression is it takes away people's hope and motivation out of the belief that nothing can really change. If depression was a commercial product, its advertising slogan would be, why bother? Why bother to go for therapy? Why bother to do the homework assignments that my therapist gives me? Why bother to read the books they recommend? Why bother to do anything? And so it's a really vitally important part of the process from the very beginning that the therapist is using the language of hope, that there's building an expectation that effort will pay off. And so the language is critically important as a vehicle for getting the idea across that if you take the time to learn something about your vulnerabilities to depression, if you take the time to learn the kinds of skills that will help reduce 
your risk factors for depression if you take the time to learn these things and participate in therapy you can expect to get better well you think about all the different ways that the language of therapy sometimes works against people developing positive expectations and we use language like somebody is an abuse survivor or we tell people your problem is biochemical or we tell people your problem is genetic the kinds of things that continue to take away the motivation to even try if i tell you your problem is genetic does that inspire you to want to do anything about it or does it make you feel like a victim of your genes and so in particular with depression where expectancy is such a critical factor not only in the response to psychotherapy but also in response to antidepressant medications this is one of the interesting findings in the research over the years that the people who have the most positive expectations for positive results are the ones who are the most responsive to antidepressants and so even a drug response is dramatically influenced by a person's quality of expectations and so the art for a brief therapist is how do i build positive expectations of change as quickly as possible this happens to be one of the reasons why i am such a strong advocate for the use of hypnosis treatment that when somebody comes in and feels hopeless if they even come in for treatment which is unfortunately not as frequent as we would like only about 20 to 25 to percent of depression sufferers will actively seek help from a mental health professional the majority of people don't because of their hopelessness but that first session becomes a very very important thing now as you know very often the first session is the only session and how important it is how you construct that first session to help the person discover that their problems are changeable their symptoms are malleable and hypnosis is perfect for that reason because if you do a hypnosis session even in the first session the person's body changes as their body relaxes their blood pressure goes down, their muscles relax, the person experiences physical changes, the person's ruminations will slow down and stop, the person experiences cognitive changes, so that you're not just intellectually talking about the possibility of change, you're demonstrating to the person that things can change, and that is a very important beginning to building positive expectations for treatment. Mm-hmm.